For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf Up Season 2, Episode 58 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami starts now. This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Jorn, if you had to design the ideal, well-compensated cirrhotic trial, how would you do it? Would you require a biopsy to get in, or would you go non-invasive? How long would you mandate a trial needed to last? 12 weeks, 12 months, 18 months, 2 years? Would you go at a biopsy endpoint, or would you go for an NIT? These are just some very simple principles that probably are worthwhile with Mason here, you here, me here, just to talk about. We're discussing MRE, which is technically challenging challenging, but in a clinical trial setting, immensely important technology because we're just seeing so much good data. The point is then how do we roll this out? So we need some additional NITs that we can link the MRE results to. And I think in the future, you have a positive trial. How do you want to translate that in real life? Maybe we're going to get to this by looking at the outcomes before we look at the improvement in fibrosis and resolution of NASH. If I'm a patient, I want you to improve my varices. I don't want to get them. I want those endpoints that affect my quality of life to be resolved before you necessarily show that you resolve my NASH. It feels almost as if some of these trials were designed more to get a statistical result than with a focus on what do you actually have to do for the patient. A couple of years ago, people were desperate to try to get a one-level reduction in fibrosis. How do we get one-level reduction in fibrosis on biopsy? How do we do it? This conversation, it feels like a more holistic, patient-sensitive, if you will, and using more tools to figure out. I do wonder if one day we will look at drugs that we stop their development and say, what if we kept going based on the new data we have, meaning NITs, they already showing their quality of the outcome, worsening lead to worsening, but their improvement lead to improvement in fibrosis stage and their improvement lead to improvement in outcome. If I could just make a plea to anybody studying cirrhosis moving forward is please, please use MR elastography. That's where we have the majority of the data on outcome, and we need to generate more of this data if we want to pivot away from a primary endpoint of histology. We really need to bring these NITs that are beginning to show promise. We need to test them and combine our data. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, hepatology researchers and key opinion leaders Drs. Jörn Schottenberg and Mazen Nureddin, as they consider current cirrhosis trials and their possible role in the shift to NITs, this week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. So we're all improvising here today. This is our second time we've tried to do a live audience during the business day. And the first we've ever done it on a regular weekly schedule. So of course, we've had tech issues and, and, and a late start because that's how Murphy works, but it'll be fine. My notes say it puts more responsibility on us to have high quality sound and video. Last week, we had a scare when Louis a single track live feed. It looked perfect during the episode, but recorded nothing. And Steven's sound is cut out on two of the last three episodes. And today we've got an echo. When I heard that Steven and Mazen might be together and might be in a less than optimal location, I realized we needed the plan B. So what uh, you, our listeners, are blessed with riches as we have not only uh, Stephen and Mazen, but also Jorn Schottenberg agreed to join us this evening. Lucky you. Jorn, how are you? Thank you, Roger. I'm fine. Glad to hear I'm plan B. It's easy for me. It's late night. Everybody's asleep in the house and I get to play by myself and <laughs> down here. Actually, Jorn, the note I have is that you've kind of become the fifth Beatle, which is a little better than plan B. Okay. So tonight you were plan B, but in terms of frequency and just stepping in and knowing all the core and the songs, you absolutely are the fifth Beatle. It works out really well. Beatles start in Germany anyway, right? Pretty much. So then we had Stephen and Mazen. How are you guys doing today? Hey, we're doing good. We're together, and uh, it's good to be able to share some post-AASLD time here. So doing very well. Excellent. And Louise, how are you today? 
Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. Okay, listen, today's format is pretty straightforward. Let's just dive in. Uh, three months ago, Stephen and Jorn came on podcast for an episode that we titled, Can Cirrhosis Drive Drug Development in NASH? And there were a couple of thoughts around that question. One had to do with whether cirrhosis was the optimal place to shift away from biopsy and conditional approvals towards a outcome-based full approval driven by NITs. That episode did really well. And in the last three months, it's turned out that our audience grows about 20% every time we're talking about moving beyond the biopsy. The desire throughout this community is really palpable, number one. And we have new cirrhosis data from ASLD and other trials with data deliverables on the horizon. So today, I thought we would look at several sets of trial data we didn't have three months ago, look at the results and ask what they suggest for cirrhosis patients, most importantly, and more broadly, for moving beyond the biopsy. No better people to have this conversation with than these four. Three guys who are closely linked with the issue and one powerful and impassioned advocate. So strap in, everyone. And here we go. First, though, our icebreaker. Just the standard one we haven't used in two or three weeks. So let's have it. Best thing, personal or professional, that happened in your life in the last week? Brave one, go first. You know, I'm going to start. And as you know, I didn't know I was on tonight. So, of course, it was great when you called me. And I was just back on, on my way back from another post-ASLD recording here in Germany, actually, from a studio. It, it was fun. Sit down with two other experts and just discuss some of the abstracts. And what do you know? Two hours later, I'm back on with you guys. So this is a great evening. Excellent. Great evening for all of us. Next. Oh, I'll jump in next. There's nothing like a phone call from Salzburg with your teenage daughter coming back saying, I've booked a flight a week early when they're closing down <laughs> Austria in total lockdown from today. Mm -hmm. But we sorted it out. She should have just touched down at Heathrow. <laughs> so getting them home was good. Excellent. You guys are too far. My personal is that I get to spend time with Mason, who, as Jorn can tell you, you know, getting time to socialize and not just talk business all the time with your hepatology colleagues is something that doesn't happen very often, particularly with the pandemic. So being able to be together for the short time we are is terrific. And also, uh, maybe just on the theme of Louise, both of my children are traveling home from college for the holidays. So I'll see one of them tonight and the other one tomorrow night. So very good. They didn't have to fly. Though. They're just driving, Louise, but still. Well, a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Marvin? Um, of course, I have to answer the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's spending some time with Stephen. <laughs> of course, no, absolutely. Spending time with Stephen is great, especially when um, he pushes you to eat the, your dessert that wife doesn't allow you to eat. And it was a big portion of cookie and a lot of ice cream. It's I called know, a skillet cookie. Yeah, I know we're, we're, we're on, a Nash, on a Nash podcast, but that was amazing. I'm also spending some time with my wife and two daughters is traveling and I love this private time with the, my family and it's great. My family is my priority. So staying with the family theme, those of you know, my kids took our grand, absconded to Texas with our granddaughter a year and a half ago and visiting them in Texas was fine. I got to see Stephen a little more, but they decided to move back and they moved back this past weekend. So we got to spend most of the weekend with my three and a half year old granddaughter who is one of the lights of my life and it was just a great weekend and she's grown so much in the last year and a half. Not that I haven't seen her, but you know, I'd see her for a day or two at a time and she was on best behavior and, and to see how much they grow and how fast they grow is really amazing you snap your fingers and it's gone you know just goes like that so with that why don't we step into business portion of our meeting basic format is pretty simple which is steven's going to take the lead in covering five different studies that we've picked out and take maybe a few minutes to go through each and then we'll ask questions and comment and to a certain degree i'll play timekeeper and at the end of all five we'll circle back and ask ourselves okay what's the message here so steven wherever you want to start dive on in yes yeah, so i think it's important important to set the stage and talk about where the field is headed in NASH and drug development. We, we all pretty much agree that there's cirrhotic trials and there's non-cirrhotic trials, kind of dividing fatty liver into those two camps. Both need to be treated. Both need to be studied. But I think we all pretty much agree that we don't want to put them in the same camp. They're really two different patient populations that each deserve a large amount of attention. We've spent a lot of time talking talking about drugs in phase two, three that are focused on fibrosis stage two and three. And outside of the conversation we've had with Yorn, we haven't spent a lot of time on the cirrhotic part of NASH drug development. So I thought we would take the next 30, 40 minutes and just kind of talk about where the field is currently in cirrhosis and what better place to do that than on the heels of AASLD. And in that vein, we did have some data presented. We had the baseline data from the reverse trial presented, I believe, by Vlad Ratsu. And then we also had some data presented from Galactic 
pectin on belapectin, just a kind of a post hoc analysis of the phase two data that really speaks to enrollment in cirrhotic trials. And I think it's important to go through that data. And then there's the Peg Belferman Valkin 2 study, which was a phase 2B readout in well compensated cirrhotics. I just want to briefly go through that, maybe open it up for some discussion. Yorn was a big part of the Galectin data that was presented. Obviously, Manal presented the Valkin 2. She's not with us today to speak to it, but I was part of that study. I don't know if Mason or Yorn, if you guys were, we can go through that. And then I want to spend the last part of this discussion on where we are currently in drug development for cirrhotics. We have three trials currently enrolling. Symmetry with the FGF21 Afruxafermin, Alpine 4 with the FGF19 Aldefermin, and then we have Galectin's ongoing adaptive phase 2-3 trial. And I think it's also, if we have time, important to reflect on the NITs in this space and how potentially we can use our NITs to transform drug development, maybe initially in cirrhotics, and we've talked about that a bit more as well. This is a good time to bring it up in the podcast. We'll also have more dialogue and interaction at NASHTAG this year, where we are fortunate enough to have some of the FDA regulators participating in those discussions. But with that being said, let me just touch on some of the data that was presented. The first one I wanted to talk briefly about was the uh, study design and baseline patient characteristics of the REVERSE trial. So as, as many of you know, REVERSE is a registrational phase three placebo-controlled multi-centered trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a beta-colic acid in adults with biopsy-confirmed NASH cirrhosis. So just top line, 3,512 patients were screened, 919 were randomized in about 11 countries in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. And most patients were white, 16% Hispanic, two-thirds of them were female. And that's consistent with what we know about NASH and advanced fibrosis is that most of these trials are over-enriched with females because it seems like they, uh, once you go through menopause, tend to progress a little bit more quicker. Uh, the baseline mean labs was a platelet count of around 187,000, ALT 52, albumin 4.29, total billy 0.75, INR 1.0. MELD was a 7.5, and looking at some of the NITs, the mean FIB4 was 2.39, NAFLD fibrosis score 0.7. 0.788 and APRI 0.8. So what that tells me is that this is a very, very well compensated trial of patients. The scores are reflective of early cirrhosis and the conclusions were patients enrolled in reverse represent a population with compensated NASH cirrhosis with no esophageal varices. And I think we get a hint of that from the baseline characteristics in the laboratory data that was presented. They go on to say that the findings from reverse provide critical information about histologic benefits of OCA and its potential role in slowing disease progression, which I think is important when we talk about study design in cirrhotic trials. What's our endpoint? Is it less hard outcomes? Is it reversing disease? And, and I think maybe that's open for discussion. Let me just stop there and see if my colleagues, Jorn or Mazen or even Louise or, or you, Roger, have any comments about what was presented relative to these baseline characteristics from the reverse trial. Thanks, Stephen, for summarizing it. You know, I pulled it up and looked at it. And I think from what you said, these patients, if I'm participating in these trusts, those patients are difficult to find by the standard labs that you'll normally get from your referring physicians. The ALT was higher than the AST, which, as we've discussed numerous times, they haven't really flipped that ratio yet, indicating a progressive fibrosis. Nonetheless, FibroScan 22 and, and, and the MRE was also 6.1. So my thinking of approaching this patient population is always it's difficult to find by standard NITs, and we really need those advanced imaging technologies to find them. Screen failure rate, I think, was decent. It's high, obviously, because these patients are difficult, and then you rely on biopsy to characterize them. But overall, very compensated early patients are difficult to recognize in standard of care. Yeah, it's a good point. I failed to mention also that this was an 18-month trial with the primary efficacy endpoint of at least one stage improvement in fibrosis with no worsening of NASH. So that's a high bar to show improvement regression of cirrhosis. Even at 18 months with an FXR, it's going to be very interesting to see the results from this. And I think if I remember from the press releases from Intercept, we should be hearing sometime in the first quarter the results of this trial. Is that, that what you guys remember? Yeah. I was interested in the varices part. I think it was based on 
imaging, not endoscopy. Uh, but I think it's okay enough for me that they don't have varices on imaging. And wh why this is important? Few things. The Galactin phase two trial, as you know, it was. I don't want to say a failure. I, I think it was they did not meet the primary endpoint of reducing portal pressures when they had the compensated cirrhosis with elevated portal pressures with varices, and they did hit that. They did hit the primary endpoint, which is reducing pressures in the non-varices group, and they also had less development of varices and the two milligram dose. So it seems that if we want to talk about the point of no return, it's possible. I don't want to like jump into conclusions. We're early in this, but it seems that varices is one of these points of no return or when it turn, I don't want to say that common, but it turns sources into a beast, which is harder to treat and you have to rustle it more. So I think that's a very important point to make on, on these varices. It's also one of the primary efficacy endpoint that the FDA has accepted and entertained to be accepted as a primary endpoint, which is what's galactin now it's based in on phase 2 B3. I just wanted to make that comment on the varices. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll just add that, again, this particular trial has a histopathologic endpoint. If there was a situation where this trial is going to be successful in hitting that endpoint, then I think they enrolled the right patients for that, because you're taking a very, very mild, almost patients just crossing over from F3. I get the sense when I, and your, your your comments would be helpful here, I get the sense when I look at these baseline characteristics that with the mean fiber scan that you commented on, some of these other baseline labs, again, just focusing on FIB4 being 2.39, platelet counts 187 as a mean, that these are very, very, very well compensated patients. And we know that variability on liver biopsy is significant. I mean, how many times have we enrolled trials where we do a biopsy and we think for all the world, they're a three and they get called a four or vice versa. They're a four, but they're called a three. There's a significant amount of variability here. And quite frankly, it's possible they enrolled some threes that were called fours. But ultimately, this is an early, early group of cirrhotics that if you were going to hit that histopathologic endpoint, you're going to want to do it prior to them developing portal hypertension as noted by varices. If there was a situation where in 900 patients treated for 18 months, you were going to see a reversal of disease. This is the population to do it. It really comes down to mechanism at this point, and does it have enough firepower to, to do the job? Yeah, and you know, the FXR, I think, as you said, could be in the right position to do that. You know, after all the discussions we had here on the podcast, I would even want to see something like spleen volume or potentially spleen stiffness on this too and see how that reverses because that's in, in a sweet spot where the spleen really starts to change, but it's not fixated yet from longstanding portal hypertension hypertension, that would be a decent analysis in this uh, subgroup of patients. Yeah, very good point, that, actually. We've been talking yeah, about yeah. spleen size. That's, that's a great point. The, that's the one, but that's the great point. But, but Jorn, that's the one <laughs> That's the one downside to some of these trials is they don't get the full complement yeah. of NITs so we can actually mine this data. Imagine if Intercept had done MR elastography, had they done PDFF, where we could get at spleen volume and spleen stiffness and all these other variables. Unfortunately, I wasn't a part of this trial, but I don't think that that was done necessarily in this study. Now, I think should be added uh, in the future for yeah. even like the phase two and threes because we know probably there's a spleen enlargement even in non serotic and I don't want to go to that today. But from what you said, it's important to point out the fiber scan of 22. I know we have the guidance in the ASLD guidance that 20 is when the, our guidance that don't cons they consider them starting to decompensate and they talk about doing endoscopy versus not endoscopy but recent data challenged that number of 20 in, in NASH and there was a paper from the Spanish group published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology I don't remember the first author but it challenged that they said maybe they and they actually have a nice kind of figure showing you the platelet correlation with the stiffness and all that. So it's probably 25 kPa in NASH serotic when you start decompensating, not 22. And also from data that we publish from our center, we know that MRE decompensation point is at least at 6.48 or something. So this 0.4 or almost 0.4 less is a lot for MRE. Another point I want to emphasize on Roger is, and I'm sorry to be a little bit tough on the industry for the serotics. I think the serotics is a 
difficult group and whatever we achieve in them will be great. The point that I want to make is, as Steven said, this one point, they got their best chance to achieve that one point improvement. Nevertheless, I'm still not sure if that one point improvement is fair enough for cirrhotic trials or at least as a test. I was given that analogy the other day and I said going from phase four to three in one stage of improvement is different from two to one. And I gave the example of two to one is going from DC to New York and four to three is going from DC to Los Angeles. It's not the same distance. So that one fibrosis stage between two and one is is totally different for from four and three and i think that's why we need the other histological features as well as that's where histo index path ai play a role we did present data from galactin and this asld looking at other serotic features that was not our idea actually the, the idea started from lupe garcia at south 10 years ago looking at nodule size septum thickness fibrosis area and i can talk about this forever but i just wanted to emphasize that as steven said one they got their best chance Two, even if God forbid and they don't reach that end point, I think they got to do a lot of sub analyses, especially in the NITs and the AI's technology. Just for the sake of time, let's move on. We got a lot still to talk about. So I just want to shift gears and talk about Galactin Therapeutics and relook at some of the, the phase two data. Paul Budis is the first author. He's the CMO of Galactin Yorn. You were on there and Eric Lowitz. This looked at the distribution of AI. ALT ratio in a cohort of patients with NASH cirrhosis and portal hypertension and correlates with portal pressure. The take-home point from this post-hoc assessment of, and I think it's a post-hoc assessment of the phase two, the AST ALT ratio above one is frequently seen in patients with compensated NASH cirrhosis and portal hypertension. We know that. That's well known when you have an AST ALT that is equivalent to each other. We know the odds rate ratio for advanced fibrosis is nine. This is well documented. What's new, or, or maybe this kind of sheds more light on this, is the AST-ALT ratio is strongly correlated with HVPG, and the take-home message from this particular poster was that this ratio could help physicians to suspect cirrhosis in patients with NAFLD, and when it's present, the ratio provides a simple non-invasive tool to estimate the degree of portal hypertension. This actually was quite fascinating to me because I did not know the second part. This ratio kind of correlated with HVPG. I think this might actually be quite helpful in identifying patients for clinical trials down the road. What what do you think, Jorn? Yeah, thanks for pulling that abstract up, Stephen. It came out of a quick discussion we had and, and is, in fact, uh, reflects the phase two data. You know, the Doritas quotient has been around for some time, and I commented on it in the previous trial you presented, so that there's nothing new here that with increasing cirrhosis, you get increased an AST, decrease in ALT, and that's how it flips. We're not so accommodated to HVPG measurements in clinical practice or clinical trials because we just haven't been doing them so often. They're tricky. They're variable. It depends on the centers. You need a good setup. I think in this very well-performed phase two trial, it was very homogeneously, and there you could see that it correlated close to the factors we know and we normally look at for patients with cirrhosis. You know, it was a quick, small analysis, but well-characterized data set, so I think that was good to see it as a poster. Yeah, I do too. Any, any additional comments from this yeah, one? I, I just want to agree with that 100%. And I want to emphasize on what Tyrone said in this is the galactin as well as the semtizumab studies, any s secondary data for them will be probably the last we see with HVPG correlation in clinical trials. Not because it's not good, it's fantastic. Uh, it's just because of the difficulty. So any secondary data, they're very valuable. And those trials were done in a very good fashion. I mean, I know the galactin reading was done by Dr. Garcia Tsao. I don't remember who read this and this met, I would imagine it will be her. So any data come out from these two with HVPGs are, are fantastic. I think it was Jaime Bosch actually that read uh, the, yeah. the, the yeah, top either of the one. top. Yeah. E either one. The, yeah. Okay. The, the last abstract was a late breaker poster number eight. It was Peg Belferman in patients with NASH and compensated cirrhosis. Results from the Valkin 2 study. Peg Belferman is an FGF21 analog, and we know that FGF21 is currently a hot mechanism in the field of NASH and is currently being studied also in cirrhosis. And so we know uh, Peg Belferman from its early days in phase two. That was previously published. Was it in Lancet? The phase two was published in, if I recall. That's correct. And, and so there 
there was this long pause while BMS enrolled uh, Valkin 1 in F3 patients and then Valkin 2 in well-compensated F4 patients. So the results of that are out. This is what was presented in late breaker poster form. Phase 2B randomized multicenter placebo-controlled study conducted at sites in the U.S. and Japan, 154 patients with histologically confirmed NASH and F4. The primary outcome, here it is, guys, another histopathologic outcome, greater than or equal to one-point improvement in fibrosis. And three different doses of drug were studied, all sub-Q weekly, 10, 20, and 40, versus placebo for 48 weeks, so one uh, roughly one year of treatment with a liver biopsy at the end. And what we see was that pegbelferman was safe and well-tolerated, but really no improvement in fibrosis relative to placebo. There was improvement in steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis as suggested by non-invasive tests, but we did not see improvement histopathologically. There was a little bit closer look at MR elastography, which was done in this trial. And if you look at those patients who had a relative 15% or greater reduction in liver stiffness as measured by MR elastography, we see that almost 45% of the 40 milligram once weekly dose achieved, 45% of the patients achieved that measure of 15% relative reduction compared to placebo at 212 and there was a dose-response relationship here. It was 11% improvement for 10 milligram, 32% improvement for 20, and then the 45% for the 40 milligram dose. So maybe a little bit of a disconnect between some of the NITs and the histopathology that was performed. We do not have AI digital pathology, fully quantitative assessment of collagen, at least as presented in poster form to my knowledge. But I open that up for Mazen or Yorn or Roger or Luis for comment. I can start since I started before Yorn, and I want to borrow his energy talking about NITs. And as I said, their primary endpoint was going from D.C. to Los Angeles, although we think it's going from D.C. to New York only. And I do wonder if these NITs are showing us that signal that it's actually moving from D.C. to New York, but you're asking for way more than we can deliver on biopsy. And that's why I think histoindex and path AI are important things to look at. I do wonder if one day we will look at drugs that we stop their development and say what if we kept going based on the new data we have meaning fast forward NITs show that they correlate they already showing they correlate with the outcome worsening lead to worsening but their improvement lead to improvement in fibrosis stage and their improvement lead to improvement in outcome we're already seeing the signal here and I do wonder if one day we say that one stage fibrosis improvement in psoriatic we killed the drug would, would it have worked it's the right decision decision to stop this program at this stage. That's what they're doing, right? Stopping yeah. it. That's why you do randomized chronicle trials to see if it's going to work or not. And thanks to the patients that they put their livers and lives will do better. Good points, Mezen. You know, the point is we're looking at a number of static NITs here. The histology obviously obtained at two time points with a high placebo response. This was something peculiar in this trial. 12 to 39 patient, the placebo group achieved the endpoint, and that was more than seen in any of the treatment drugs. The MRE changes, as Stephen highlighted, a little bit of a disconnect. Small patient numbers, so bottom line, maybe not too much change. The one marker that's interesting to me here, and I'm looking at the poster, is in figure 4C, there's the Pro-C3. Now, Pro-C3 is an experimental marker. If you think of the pathophysiology, um, it's a little, you can say it's more dynamically, more pro-fibrogenic. And what you see in the high dose, it, in the very beginning, it turns down, if I can interpret the results that way, it turns down fibrogenesis a little bit, but then goes back up to normal. So it looks like the drug can maintain its efficacy over time. And what I like about the pro 3 of course, you have uh, five or six uh, time points over the treatment course of those 48 weeks. And, and that's the clear advantage that you get to understand what happens during the trial, not just looking at the start and end. So I think that's why I like that particular data set in here. Let me just be pragmatic. So we talked a little bit about Peg Belferman, 48-week trial, what, three different doses, placebo, biopsy to get in, biopsy to get out, greater than or equal to one stage improvement fibrosis. We talked about collectin there, looking at a non-invasive test as an endpoint, prevention of progression of varices. Thinking about this, whether you use histology or whether you go for an NIT, what I'm beginning to sense is we really want to try to target those patients that are super early on in cirrhosis before they develop portal hypertensive complications, because I think that's a different beast. Hemodynamically, it's a different patient. How much can we really move scar tissue? I think I would like to see 
see that we can move scar tissue in a very early, well-compensated cirrhotic first before we try to attempt that in a mixed bag of patients, some that have portal hypertension, some that don't. And quite frankly, I think we learned that from the Galectin trial. Yorn, if you had to design the ideal, well-compensated cirrhotic trial, how would you do it? I'm speaking in reference to, would you require a biopsy to get in or would you go non-invasive? How long would you mandate a trial needed to last? 12 week, 12 months, 18 months, two years. Would you go at a biopsy endpoint or would you go for an NIT? I think these are just some very simple principles that probably are worthwhile with Mason here, you here, me here, just to talk about. Yeah, great points. Based on what we've seen, I would say I would not do a biopsy controlled histological endpoint trial. I would want to do an NIT driven trial, potentially looking at clinical outcomes, but that's maybe not optimal in that very early population. Prevention of varices is an attractive, but also not straightforward endpoint. So NITs, we've discussed MRE changes a lot, and there is good evidence linking MRE changes to improvement, prevention of endpoints, but also increases to endpoints. So I think that's the best data set we have, and I, and I would probably want to try for that. You can discuss and make a case that you want to want to get a baseline biopsy to show the histology, but then in the end, I wouldn't base it on changes on histology as an outcome. I will take an approach a little bit more conservative because I want to be in the middle between the NITs I love and I push for and the regulators point of view. And I really want to give them a credit. In terms of baseline enrollment, I just want to mention that they were part of the NASH forum paper that was written and defined inclusion criteria for cirrhotics. Your own to your point, there is a biopsy in it, but there's a non-biopsy part which goes into 1A and 1B and 1B was strong enough and part of it was also not based on biopsy. It was not based on NITs, but was based on things that we know, nodular liver, lower platelet and spleen, which we all have confidence in that the patient's cirrhotic. So the regulators are moving toward that step in terms of not needing biopsy for inclusion in cirrhotic clinical trials. So I'll give them a credit there. I honestly will also take the non-development of varices as an acceptable immediate next step. The reason why, because between the Stellars and the Simtizumab trials, Simtizumab was probably enriched with sicker patients that 20% developed decompensation within 20 years, and we know a lot of them were cryptogenic. They had more probably thicker septas and more collagen. The Stellar data was less than that, about 15%, and and probably slightly longer time or like maybe the same time. So it will still take us a long time to develop complication, and that's why I think development of varices is an acceptable endpoint for me. I'm not sure where's their position in terms of worsening of MEL score. I do like that as well as immediate next step. Nevertheless, I totally agree with you that in the future we need to know how much improvement in MRE is correlating one step improvement in fibrosis on biopsy and what that correlates to outcome. And I think that is the future and the way to go. Yeah, I think that's probably generally true whether we're talking about cirrhosis or not. If I catch the thread of the last three weeks. I have a question for you, gents, because you were around when these things were designed, and I'm combining my lack of strong historic knowledge of NASH with my high school science classes. But where I wind up is it feels almost as if some of these trials were designed more to get a statistical result than with a focus on what do you actually have to do for the patient. Things felt like that to me a couple of years ago. People were desperate to try to get a one-level reduction of fibrosis. How do we get one-level reduction of fibrosis on biopsy? How do we do it? How do we do it? How do we do it? And I'm listening to this conversation. It feels like a more holistic, patient-sensitive, if you will, and using more tools to figure out, so where do we want to, what do we want to do, where do we want to get to? I think that's accurate. I mean, when these trials were designed, and I maybe would exclude uh, galactin here with belapectin because I think there was a lot of thought given to the results of the phase two trial and the post hoc analysis that showed that there was a subset of patients that potentially did derive a benefit, and uh, a lot of thought was put into, if that's the case, how would we design a trial to clarify? verify that point and unmask this heretofore unresolved issue of can the drug prevent the development of varices. Prior to that, we all wanted to do something for cirrhotics because when we see these people in clinic, there's not a lot we have to offer them. And we know that they're at high risk of disease progression and liver cancer. And so we want to do whatever we can to try to get a drug that, that works in this patient population. And the first way to do that was to show regression of fibrosis. As we've 
kind of matured the field a little bit, and we have non-invasive tests that are linking to outcome measures such as MR elastography. And we also are beginning to understand that, hey, just halting disease. You know, if you're a well-compensated cirrhotic, like people that were enrolled in reverse, most of those people probably don't even know they have cirrhosis. They're walking and talking and living a normal life. And I don't know how many times Jorn and Maz and myself see people and we tell them they're cirrhotic and they have this, this look of shock on their face. Like, what do you mean I have cirrhosis? I feel fine, doc. I'm, I'm not yellow. I'm not, I don't look like the Michelin man. I'm, I'm good. But if we could halt the disease there and they could live 20 years with that same quality of life without developing liver cancer, we'd be fine with that. We'd be happy with that. And we don't have that yet as an endpoint. So that's another thing to, to contemplate. Stephen, we have a question out of the audience um, from uh, Sen Sundaram from uh, Turns, and I'd like to br- invite Sen to come in. Hello, how are you? Pleasure to be on the part of the audience. Good to see you. Hey, Sen, how are you? Hey, Sen. Hey, doing well. Thanks. Good to see you both. Your floor, Sen. Um, so this is a great conversation, and I think way overdue for all of us to have it. One question I have, you know, I think back to uh, my days at Intercept when PBC was still called primary biliary cirrhosis. That was, for a lot of folks, a misnomer, and there's a big effort to change that to cholangitis, the, the last letter there. As we're talking about using non-invasives for a study in a cirrhotic population, I almost think that there's a little bit of a contradiction there, right? because I, I believe cirrhosis is defined by the histopathology, right? And is it, are we overdue for a change, not just from perhaps NAFLD to MAFLD, uh, but really thinking about, I don't, I don't know what the right term would be, end-stage liver disease as opposed to cirrhosis? Thank you for the opportunity to, to ask the question. No, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, end-stage liver disease sounds probably more harsh than cirrhosis because end-stage. So. I don't know if I will pick that name. I think it's still fair game to call these patients cirrhotic on the natural history and what we know about NASH because they, really their next step is they go from whatever scale you want to use, Brunt, Kleiner, if, even if you want to apply other scales, is the same histological process and eventually photohypertension and they go there. So it's not unfair to call it cirrhosis when they have that histology that we see. It's a little bit different from primary biliary cholangitis. So I, I don't know if I got your question correctly, but I think we're coining them with the right terminology. Yeah, you know, my take of it, Stephen, you want to go next, but my, my take of it is we, we are linking our ourselves to histology in defining cirrhosis sin, and that's what you come from. And maybe we should call it MRE high disease or something, but that disconnects it from all the clinical data and all the experience we have. You know, we have the Bavino criteria defining unlikely outcomes in these cirrhotic patients' populations. There is room to argue that we need to define our disease population by NITs, but we have to kind of stick to what we know from caring for these patients. That's why you can't totally disconnected. Maybe we can use the 6.1 that we have from the reverse data as definitive cirrhosis, not needing biopsy, eventually move to that MRE improvement as primary endpoints and patients' outcomes and all that. So it's kind of applying the NITs, replacing liver biopsy, not taking away the terminology because the terminology, the natural history is is set in my in our mind. Already. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you raised a good point, Sin, and I think the way you Warren and Mason are working through this is the right way to think about it. I mean, cirrhosis to me is a clinical term. It's something when we tell patients they have cirrhosis, it conjures up a sense of in-stageness that something bad is happening in their liver that needs potential immediate attention and the likelihood of having a negative outcome, whether that be death, liver transplant, liver cancer, developing complications of their disease, encephalopathy, varices, bleeding, and Societies all kind of start to come up. As a, those are all clinical things, clinical discussions we have with our patient. For the, the nuances of clinical trials in patients with NASH, quantifying that degree of fibrosis, as Jorn and Mazin mentioned, with MRE, which I think is really kind of coming to the forefront as the test that is best at quantifying the severity of scar tissue and using that in the purposes of clinical trial development is probably 
probably more apropos. I think we still need that clinical word to have that discussion with our patients. Again, generally speaking, when we think of cirrhosis, we're not thinking of somebody that's walky and talky, that acts normal, that's not fatigued, that doesn't have varices. I mean, we've gotten so good at diagnosing advanced fibrosis now that we will tell patients they have cirrhosis when clinically they behave just like you and I do. Yep. And I think, Jorn, you characterize it well, right? It's trying to sort of disconnect the phenotype of a population that we're studying from the biopsy. And yeah, other alternatives could be, for example, a high-risk population or a presumed cirrhosis, right? I think we've seen a lot of studies with presumed NASH or presumed NAFL. Maybe that's another angle. But uh, yeah, I think these are all great points that you've uh, all brought up. So, Sen, let me toss one out from a completely different direction, which is I'll be a marketer for a second. One of the things I've heard since forever is all the negative valence around the word cirrhosis in the mind of the patient. They think it means they must be an alcoholic issue, they must be drunk, so they have a very hard time absorbing it. I wonder if over time, rethinking the nomenclature might be patient-friendlier, forgetting about everything else. Does that make any sense to any of you guys? I mean, is end-stage liver disease a friendlier nomenclature than cirrhosis? So let me go, go back to Stephen's earlier comment when he was talking about our patient. When we explain histology to patients, or we try to, we talk about the term cirrhosis. The first thing I tell them, cirrhosis is not a death sentence. It's not end of life. A lot of people live where you at for many, many, many years. And then I explain to them there's A and B and C, which is the child abuse score. And your solid A, if they come with child A, of course. And then between A and B takes a long time and go to B and C. So to answer your question directly without talking too much, using the word end in general for me is not a good use of another for anything end or <laughs> one of the, the struggles I struggle when I explain to them fibrosis stage four and then I tell them cirrhosis it translates to the, in their brain into stage four the people hear it in, in, in the TV it's like stage four cancer this is bad so stage four stay away from it end state uh, stay away from it uh, to me I'll still call it cirrhosis for me the cirrhotic term has some negative stigma related to, mostly to alcohol though a lot will associate it with that I'd like the term scarring I discuss the scarring of their liver with them and I refer to the skin because, you know, that's where they have scars and they know what happens. It's for sure a different thing, but I think that's when they can visualize what happens. So, Sen, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sen. Bye, thanks. Yeah, for the sake of time, Roger, I just wanted to finish up with where we are with the trials that are currently ongoing. And, you know, there, there are three trials, if you look at clintrials.gov, that are currently enrolling NASH cirrhotics. And just at a high level, those are a Caro's symmetry trial with a fruxifermin, uh, which is looking at, at two different doses of drug versus placebo. It's a 36-week trial with the primary endpoint being improvement in fibrosis by at least one stage with no worsening of NASH. So there's a 36-week trial with biopsy in, biopsy out. And then we talked about the Galectin trial that's still ongoing, phase 2B3. So there's an 18-month phase 2B portion. There's an 18-month phase 3 portion. You have to have NASH cirrhosis without varices, a child's score of less than 7, and really no clinical signs of portal hypertension. The idea there is to look at two different doses of drug. This is an infusion given every two weeks compared to placebo, and you're looking at preventing the development of esophageal varices. And so uh, the primary efficacy endpoint is the proportion of patients in the bellopectin treatment groups who develop varices at 78 weeks or 18 months of treatment compared to placebo. And then finally, Alpine 4, which is an FGF19 cirrhotic trial looking at aldefermin. In that particular trial, again, you have to have a biopsy showing NASH with F4 disease. These are child's PUA patients with no history of decompensation or varices. And treatment is for 48 weeks with the primary endpoint being improvement in fibrosis by at least one stage with no worsening of NASH. So we have ultimately three trials currently enrolling, one FGF21, one FGF19, and one with velopectin, which is a galactin-3 inhibitor. Two of these have histology as that primary 
endpoint. One at 36 weeks, one at 48 weeks, and then one is a non-invasive looking at the development of varices. Maybe importantly, when we begin to focus on these NITs, particularly we've talked about MR elastography. Unfortunately, I don't believe any one of these have MRE being a part of the trial, which if I could just make a plea to anybody studying cirrhosis moving forward is please, please use MR elastography. That's where we have the majority of the data on outcomes, and we need to generate more of this data if we want to pivot away from a primary endpoint of histology. We really need to bring these NITs that are beginning to show promise. We need to test them and combine our data. That's another weakness of our field is we're all stovepiped and we're not focused on, hey, look, let's de-identify this data. Let's bring it all together and look at the power of what that can do relative to a non-invasive test. So it would have been nice, in my opinion, to have MR elastography. Before we discuss this question, the Gilead trial, is it phase four as well? well that's a good point. Yeah. Yep, that's right. There's the triple combo, right? Yeah. And again, it's in well-compensated yeah. F4. I think the pill, they are going into one one pill. They're combining them. They had data that Naim presented in previous meeting about the NITs in open-label study without a placebo, as you guys all know. In that trial, are they using MR elastography? Are they collecting I, NITs? I have to double-check. It sounds like double. they, because I think Naim presented some of MRE for the... It did have MRI PDFF. It did have a fiber scan. It did not have MRE. Oh. Otherwise, I would have applied the mass score on it immediately. Um, <laughs> don't know about the current design. Everyone is starting it now, so we're just getting familiarized with the protocol now. You know, just reflecting on that again, we're discussing MRE, which is technically challenging, but in a clinical trial setting, immensely important technology, I believe, because we're just having seeing so much so much good data. The point is then, how do we roll this out? So we need some additional NITs that we can link the MRE results to. And if you think in the future you have a positive trial, how do you want to translate that in real life practice? So I think in the clinical trial setting, it's great, but we need additional NITs alongside. Yeah, and the MRE is, I don't want to complicate things. It has its own complications in terms of interpretation and the longitudinal movement. A lot of things that needs to be considered. For instance, if you're defattening the liver, you have to take volume change in consideration and relative to the MRE. I had this fascinating conversation with Becky Taub the other day about MRE changes and the volume changes. If we get it correctly, it will be true representation of decreased fibrosis that the regulation look like overall stiffness of the liver in a more universal way that will correlate with outcome eventually so you know the other thing is it is expensive for sure that's one consideration that has to be taken uh, as you develop these trials is the cost of doing that uh, there are other non-invasive tests like elf that may be helpful in this particular context in obtaining serum where Things like Pro-C3 and ELF and the components of ELF can be looked at and maybe even looked at in combination or sequentially with some of these imaging modalities. In the right setting, if you have even fiber scan in this population of patients where you combine it with maybe another NIT like an ELF score, I think could be very helpful. So I don't want to just harp on MR elastography. I like MRE because of what we've seen relative to long-term outcomes. And if there was a chance for an NIT to quickly work its way into the vernacular of a primary endpoint, I think MRE has that potential in a well-compensated F4 population study. One quick thing, also in addition to the ELF and these tests, so like we're complete and no one be left out. There are tests that measure function. Greg Averson, he worked on that technology. I think studying liver function is great. There are metabolomics, proteomics, metabolomics. There are data that, for instance, from OWL, they looked at not just the NASH component, they have fibrosis component. So to your own point, enriching NITs and correlating it with MRE other than the famous ones such as ELF and NIST4 and DOS and FAST and the new scores, the newcomers are very promising and we should include those in the formula as well. So we're kind of at the bottom, of the, in fact, we're a little bit past the bottom of the hour. Louise, I don't even know because I can't see and I can't hear you. I, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add or, or any thoughts or questions. No, 
know, I just thought it was a, a fascinating discussion. And when I was listening to the guys there, I was just thinking there was a very good poster done on hepatic vein portal gradient-based risk stratification in patients with compensated naphthal cirrhosis, which was basically saying very much where the conversation went, which was if you can look at where the cutoff is, where you get the outcomes and mortality, then maybe we can find resolution to naphthal and NASH or the outcomes before we actually meet the primary endpoints for the FDA. That showed that less than 10 for portal pressure, you had very little mortality. But once you got 10 to 15, it increased and again, greater than 16. So maybe we're going to get to this by looking at the outcomes before we look at the improvement in fibrosis and resolution of NASH because the outcomes and resolving those or improving them. And if I'm a patient, I want you to improve my varices. I don't want to get them. I want those endpoints that affect my quality of life to be resolved before you necessarily show that you resolve my NASH. Because yes, that affects my quality of life, but it's everything else around it that predict what's going to happen to me. So I thought it was a fascinating discussion. That poster by Raphael Paternostro summed up where certainly a lot of the discussion went. I would have liked to have seen some NITs used on this. So where was the cutoff this for fibre scan, MMRE on the portal vein pressure gradients? But then we can put it into more routine clinical practice. I think that's a long way to go, but I enjoyed the discussion. It was great. Thanks, Louise. And I have one quick thought before we get a closing question. Stephen, I've heard you use the term stovepiped forever, and today's the day I understood what you were talking about, which is, is it's a bit of a prisoner's dilemma. If I only do what's best for me, and I don't have a lot of money, I do the most efficient tests that I know exactly what they are, and I don't worry about developing knowledge. The profession kinds of would have it go another way, and somehow, on a prisoner's dilemma, you win by having everybody work together, and if you don't, then everybody kind of fails. Here, it's an interesting question, how you drive that process forward. All three of you guys are doing a lot of work on that, and so are some other people. With that, final question. If we have this conversation again in six months, what's the most important thing that would be different? Brave one, go first. You want know to suggest you or Louis be brave because Steve and Mazen are in meet right now. Roger, I just want to interrupt. So I've got I got Naeem Al Khoury on the phone here. He is the principal investigator of the combo trial with, in well compensated cirrhotics with SEMA. Uh, Naeem, can you hear us? Uh, yes, yes. Are we talking about the Gilead with Novo trial? Yes. Yes. So the question that came up from that trial, and, and today's episode is on cirrhosis, and we were talking about the trials currently enrolling. <laughs> Mazen reminded us that there was the ongoing trial with SEMA, the ACC inhibitor, and the FXR. So what we couldn't remember was were specific NITs being obtained in that trial, such as MR elastography? Uh, No, they're not doing MR elastography. I think it has to do with the cost more than anything else. So it's going to be a biopsy study. And the primary endpoint is improvements in fibrosis. Okay. That's what we, we we were... One of the things we commented on was that MRE apparently is not being included in any of the ongoing trials in cirrhosis, and one of the reasons is cost, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a missed opportunity. Also, you know, also they have their own combination trial, and that includes some cirrhotics, and uh, as far as I know, there's no MRE in that one as well. Yeah, well, super. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us thanks, for one, one quick call. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> Good to hear you, Naeem, and great move, Steve. Great save, Stephen, and awesome. So, Stephen, that is the prisoner's that is the prisoner's dilemma, right? The reason we don't do it is because of cost. There you go. Okay. Have this conversation in six months. What'll be different? You know, my hopes are we'll get more people interested in that really advanced patient population, early cirrhotics, have invest into that arena where there's a medical need and we might have more interesting MOIs, mechanisms, action MOAs uh, being explored. So maybe more trials on, on the way uh, beyond the ones that Stephen mentioned. Okay, thanks. Next. I'm just going to jump in and say, hopefully after listening to this episode, somebody might find a way to resolve this cost solution for MRE in clinical trials so that we can see more of it included? Well, you know, I will just say, look, I'm excited there are people studying cirrhotics. That is sorely needed. It's something that as a community, we all want to develop a therapy for. What I'd like to see is take these lessons learned about the variability of liver biopsy and the complications of trying to show improvement in people who have developed portal hypertension. We've got that part down. We know we've got to study early cirrhotics if we want to see 
an initial benefit, whether it's NIT or whether it's a histopathologic benefit. But I, I think where we need to not be myopic is we need to do everything we can collectively to use our NITs that we're developing to help us bridge beyond a biopsy. And, you know, you don't have to answer this all by yourself. We can collect the data and we can combine the data in a fraternity of sorts to begin to analyze collectively through the power of combination data sets, through meta-analyses, what, what's really happening with NITs relative to this data set. But we can't do it if we don't collect the data. I'll in there. Maybe Mazen has additional comments. I mean, along the same line, I think six months you're not going to see much. You're probably going to see one other company adopting MRE in their study if they are starting clinical trial in cirrhotic. In one year, I would like to see more data in ITs, as Stephen said, correlating them. I want to know how much MRE, ELF, PROC3 correlate with one stage improvement. So as the PATH AI and HISTO index, I want to get the details how much movement we get with all of those with one stage improvement. And I want to emphasize that's not the goal eventually because the FDA is saying study it with outcome. But before we go there, we need to know these details. And then eventually these NITs, how they correlate their improvement with improvement and outcome. They correlate very well with worsening now. Worsening those need to worsening outcome. We want to see it, as I say, the other side of the freeway coming improvement. How much is that and quantify so we can use it as primary endpoint, hopefully with cirrhosis at one point. So I'll, I'll give that a year or two to get there and we'll move hopefully beyond the biopsy, which will make Donna happy. It will make Donna happy. Which will make Donna very happy. Yeah. And we'll be talking more about that over the next few weeks. So what I'm hearing from you folks today, and this is a race in which I don't particularly have a horse, is that to get what you're talking about, Stephen, to get better integrated data using a broader set of markers, we're going to have to find a way to demonstrate increased value to people who don't have a lot of loose cash to doing that. It could come from discussions with regulators. It could come from somebody doing a piece of trial that demonstrates the value. But the sand will shift slowly in the right direction, but slowly until somebody uh, has a breakthrough that proves increased value. And then I think the floodgates open. Whether that happens in the next six months or not isn't clear to me. And I certainly whatever we can do with this podcast to help it happen we're going to because it's one of the things we believe in so i think that's having listened to where i wind up with that let me thank everybody because there's been a lot of tweaking of schedules and timelines and stuff to make this happen so uh mazen steven thank you good to see both of you bjorn thank you so much louise and uh, i'll be back with business section in a couple seconds you all have a happy thanksgiving and uh we'll see you soon okay thanks bye-bye now Welcome to today's episode 58 business section. We wrapped up recording the main body of episode 58 half an hour ago. Because this week is Thanksgiving, we're going to try to produce this episode and all the conversations by the end of day tomorrow. You'll hear them at the same time you usually do, but Eric and Michael get some time off, and frankly, I will as well. This week's number is four out of seven. It's only Monday, but we've already cleared the 1,000 download benchmark this week for the fourth time in seven weeks. Not bad, considering the first time we cleared even 900 was eight weeks ago. Here are a couple other metrics about listenership. In the last 30 days, Buzzsprout has recorded over 4,700 downloads from listeners in 28 countries on six continents. Google has found some kind of site visit in that same period from 55 different countries. Remember, I've told you Buzzsprout is conservative because they're IAB-based. Podstatus.com has placed us on the top 250 medical lists in 10 to 12 countries per day for the last two weeks, including three to five of the world's top 10 pharma markets. Which ones depend on and how many depend on the day? That's one thing we have to be thankful for this year. December will have some of our best programming yet. Next week, Jeff Lazarus returns to discuss the recent very important consensus statement advancing the global public health agenda for NAFLD that appeared in Nature Review's Gastroenterology and Hepatology last month. The following week, Stephen Harrison and friends will preview NASHTAG 2022, which promises to have some absolutely amazing moments in it. The week after that, Ali Amirian from the Cleveland Clinic joins us along with Naeem al Khoury to discuss the Splendor study with its remarkable findings on bariatric surgery's potential impact on cirrhosis. And throughout the month, we will have brief interviews with some of our friends and guests from throughout the year, put a cap on 2021 and set the stage for what promises to be a fantastic and really important 2022. Roger, what's in the vault this week? 
As many old downloads as people are grabbing, the Vault has some great options. From season one, the first four episodes all got some attention. Episode one was the year's co-leader for the second straight week, and episode four was my introductory episode if anybody cares. Along with episode 39, which discussed how the then brand spanking new COVID vaccine might affect patient treatment and drug development. In season two, the remarkable Paris Nash imaging conversation, 46.2, gained another 63 new downloads since Thursday morning to go over 550. Our second biggest episode today is slightly over 300. Think about the gap between those. Episodes 42 and 43, with Arun Sanyal talking about FGF and Jorn Schottenberg talking about cirrhosis, respectively, both did well. And among the more recent episodes, everything has done well, but episode 50, with Lars Johansson discussing new analytics, 51 with Scott Friedman discussing stellate cells and precision medicine, and 52 with Lena Allen discussing more on MRE, all scored high. As I said, I want to get this wrapped up and over to Mike Wilson so we can start work and get to Thanksgiving and cooking early, so I'm out. Thanks to all the people who made this possible. Our surfers, Yorn, who, as I said on the episode, is becoming something like the fifth Beatle, and Mazin, who always brings laughter and perspective. My amazing co-host, Stephen and Louise. Stephen, who carried the ball this week, and Louise, I'm confident to hear much more from next week when we're talking about the NAVL consensus document. Mike Wilson, who has salvaged some truly remarkably tech-impaired recordings over the last couple of weeks, and does it all with talent, energy, and a smile. Eric Rounds, who keeps you informed and me on my toes. Steve Ennin, whose major project should be getting started soon. Buzzsprout and Riverside, and Simon and says whose software enables us to do what we do. Finally, all of you folks, our listeners, provide energy and inspiration to do this every week and point us in the right direction as we keep asking ourselves, okay, what next? That's an earful for you, mouthful or two for me, so I'm done. Stay safe, surf on, enjoy Thanksgiving, count your blessings, and we'll see you next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website.